Thanks, Michael. I'm one of the people that we spent a couple hours every uh, five minutes <laughs> um, <laughs> during the uh, Dodd-Frank process, and it's, it's great to be here in Ann Arbor. The architects of Dodd-Frank established CFPB so it could address the glaring weaknesses in the regulation of financial institutions to protect consumers that were exposed by the financial crisis and which almost sunk the world economy. The root of the crisis was a consumer protection failure of massive proportions, where millions of borrowers received mortgages that were designed in ways that made failure more likely than not, in which they were entirely unable to repay. As a result, millions of families unnecessarily lost their houses, causing untold pain and loss of wealth to families and communities. These foreclosures had ripple effects through the financial system because of little-known leveraged bets financial institutions placed on them. These financial system failures had ripple effects through the real economy, causing large unemployment, more defaults, more misery that we're yet to recover from. How were all these bad mortgage loans possible? There are several reasons. First, there was no market intelligence or early warning system to even recognize the problem until it was too late. Second, there was no one entity responsible for tracking or addressing consumer protection problems in the financial arena. In fact, several agencies, as Michael mentioned, several agencies at the federal level had consumer protection responsibilities for banks, and the FTC had limited enforcement authority for non-banks. Um, the Federal Reserve had rule writing authority under a number of statutes, but consumer protection was not their top priority and couldn't really have been expected to be. They had to deal with safety and soundness of banks and bank holding companies, monetary policy to control inflation and promote full employment, payment systems. All this stuff came before consumer protection. Third, preemption of state mortgage lending protections, such as those, those passed by North Carolina, where I'm from by federal banking regulators and the limited ability for state attorneys general to fill the breach was another problem. Fourth, there were virtually no substantive rules protecting borrowers in mortgage lending. The classic abusive mortgage during the boom time was the 228 subprime loan. Over half of the loans that minority families received during the boom were these subprime very bad mortgages. They were often originated by mortgage brokers under a compensation structure that incented the broker to put borrowers in these mortgages, even if they um, qualified for a conventional middle-class mortgage. Um, they were often originated on behalf of large unregulated non-banks like Countrywide, New Century, AmeriQuest, and usually sold to private label security investors through Wall Street. They often did not document income or assets, promoting fraud in what brokers reported. The loans often did not amortize, so they had teaser payments as interest-only loans, or in the case of 228s, teaser rates, both leading to huge unsustainable payment shock that families simply could not absorb. And to top it off, there was a, often a very large prepayment penalty, which took the family's equity as a, a quid pro quo of being able to get out of a bad loan and into a good one. The amazing thing was that all these mortgage features, other than the outright fraud that the system promoted and ignored, were legal at the time. It is kind of amazing to contemplate. And finally, a fifth problem was that there was no federal entity to supervise non-bank lenders, as well as entities like the credit bureaus, which have a huge impact on who gets loans and at what cost. That's quite a list of consumer protection failures that helped lead to the financial crisis. And of course, mortgages weren't the only type of product where these kind of problems existed. It was just the largest one. A few additional examples, Michael mentioned many of them, payday loans, student loans, overdraft charges by banks, tricks and traps with credit cards and prepaid cards. The Dodd-Frank solution, I think, still was a wise one. Create one federal agency with the mandate to protect consumers of financial products and arm it with a toolkit sufficient to the task capable of addressing the failures I just discussed. First, establish one agency with independence from political pressures by Congress or the administration. This independence is the case with all other federal uh, safety and soundness regulators and is probably even more important for an agency to protect consumers. Second, the agency would serve a market monitoring function and be informed by a complaint database where consumers across the country could obtain redress so problems in mortgage lending wouldn't have come as such a surprise. 
Third, recognizing that CFPB may not have all the answers or that there may be times when CFPB is not sufficiently rigorous in protecting consumers. The agency's rules would serve as a floor and not a ceiling. As a result, states could enforce their own laws that are more protective of consumers than CFPB's rules. Also, state attorneys general could enforce CFPB's rules in case CF CFPB decided at a particular time not to. Fourth, provide the agency with the rule writing authority that was shared among different federal agencies. These rules would establish a level playing field for banks and non-banks. They'd also prevent responsible lenders and providers from having to relax their standards to compete with others who don't have those views. Fifth, the agency would supervise large banks and large non-banks and all mortgage lenders. Six, it would also have enforcement authority in case supervision is not enough and its regulated entities don't follow its rules. That was the vision that the Dodd-Frank architects had to address the problems that led to the crisis. I think what, I think what our panel is gonna do is talk about those different tools and how they've been applied, how they might be applied in the future. So if, after that, uh, lead in. I think I'll introduce the um, each panelist once they're about to talk. I think Peggy Tui is going to come first. She's the Assistant Director for Supervision Policy at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me here, and thank you for asking me to come to Treasury uh, back in 2009. It's been, uh, ever since then, it's been interesting, challenging, uh, to be involved as the CFPB story continues to unfold. Um, as Eric said, um, uh, I'm head of supervision policy which at, at CFPB, which has the responsibility of setting strategy for both the bank and non-bank supervision program, as well as ensuring that as we supervise our, um, the, the calls we make on legal violations and how we apply uh, our expectations are consistent across the bank and non-bank markets. Um, I wanna say a little bit about my background before Michael asked me to come over to Treasury and before I got started with CFPB because that informs my remarks and my perspective that you'll hear today. Um, and before that, I was at the Federal Trade Commission, so I spent most of my career in, um, in the public sector and I was in, at the Federal Trade Commission in the Division of Financial Practices, which as Eric mentioned, um, only has jurisdiction over non-banks and primarily uh, enforcement authority as a tool. So um, with that background in mind, I wanna talk about three different things. One is, um, from my viewpoint, given that background, how I think the oversight of compliance with federal consumer financial law has um, uh, improved with the creation of the Bureau and what difference the supervision program of the Bureau has made. And in particular, I want to mention the supervision of the credit bureaus, of the largest consumer reporting agencies, as well as the furnishers to those systems, and talk about why I think that was a significant addition to the federal oversight landscape for consumers. Um, and then third, I was going to talk about also, um, I saw something in the materials about technology. We're supposed to be talking about technology. Um, so I want to talk about some of the benefits and pitfalls that the Bureau has found um, as institutions rely and perhaps increasingly, increasingly rely on technology to facilitate compliance. So that's part and parcel of just the way things are done these days, as you all know. So as was mentioned by Michael and Eric, um, before the crisis, there was no agency with supervisory and enforcement authority over, over both the banks and non-banks. Um, to oversee compliance with federal consumer law. The FTC had enforcement authority only, um, and therefore that meant there was limited ability to really prevent violations from occurring. The primary tool was after the fact law enforcement. So when there was smoke coming out, hopefully not of the hotel we're, <laughs> we're, we're staying in, um, but smoke coming out, um, you know, the law enforcer see that smoke goes in, tries to stop the fire and get, you know, any, uh, any remedies back to consumers that were injured, as opposed to going in and making sure that those alarms are working. Um, they are we working. heard this morning. <laughs> They're working. <laughs> and uh, so that uh, the fire can be stopped at the earliest point or prevented, uh, better yet prevented uh, in the first place. Um, so now, um, eight years later, 
Um, it's a completely different consumer protection regulatory landscape. The Bureau not only has enforcement authority, but supervisory authority as well, and that extends across the largest banks and uh, many of the non-banks that are basically, some of them, in the exact same markets doing very similar things. And so we can see across that landscape as we do our supervisory work. Um, so we've built our supervisory program, and I guess I should mention, I'm using that word as if everyone knows what that means. That's where um, basically examiners can go in to the institution. It can be on-site or off-site, but we have the authority to ask for information from the bank or the non-bank about how they're complying with the law. We have the ability to ask for information to help the examiners assess compliance with the law. And we can look for risk to consumers. So it's all very um, ongoing, real-time information gathering and assessment as opposed to a longer, stretched out um, investigatory process. Um, so it's, it's basically the primary tool is sending an exam teams to be on site to engage with the company officials, ask them about what they're doing, what their compliance systems are, and to evaluate, do transaction testing, and to evaluate whether they're complying with the law. So we've built this um, program, and the foundation is to ensure that entities have compliance management systems in place, and that they are engaging in ongoing self-monitoring and correction, um, and including where they evaluate the root cause of any problems, and they put into place um, anything that's needed to try to address those root causes. So that's the basic goal, to, um, to aim at prevention of law violations in the first place. It's more comprehensive um, than solely looking after the fact whether they violated the law. It's trying to make sure they have systems in place to ensure that doesn't happen in the first place. That's the primary goal. And because we prioritize our supervisory work based on risk, it also provides an incentive to meet those expectations in that if we go in and we see a bank or a non-bank with a very robust compliance management system, then we are assured that they are doing the self-monitoring, self-correction, and we, the CFPB, don't have to spend as many of our resources going back as early and often to look at what they're doing. Conversely, if we're troubled by what we see, then they're higher on our risk uh, metrics, and then they're scheduled for examination reviews more frequently. And what we found is that many non-banks, and banks, by the way, um, have indeed improved with this kind of oversight, because our oversight, as, as compared to the past, first and foremost, is solely focused on consumer compliance. That's our only focus, not as the other regulators had a combined focus that was prior uh, preeminently concerned with safety and soundness and other compliance issues. Um, so we, we have seen improvement, especially but not only in the non-bank marketplace, where they now have compliance managed systems in place that they never had before. Um, one example of that is um, the biggest consumer reporting uh, agencies. Um, the consumer reporting market, as many of you know, plays a critical role um, in our economy, in consumers' lives. It has such an enormous reach and impact. Um, over 200 million Americans have credit files with the biggest credit bureaus, um, and trade lines are furnished um, voluntarily by over 10,000 providers. Um, and it's probably a given how important these credit reports can be in so many aspects of consumers' lives. And also to those that use the credit reports, it's important um, to the businesses that use it that, that it be accurate. But it, um, it's interesting to me, um, kind of surprising, that um, despite this critical importance of this infrastructure, until the CFPB, there was no federal or state agency that had oversight authority to go in and monitor compliance had supervisory authority, not the states, not the federal government. It was only, again, the FTC with kind of, and, and the states with kind of this after the fact law enforcement authority. And so the CFPB, one of the first things we did when we needed to establish a rule to be able to supervise some of the non-banks, uh, our first priority was uh, establishing a rule that would let the CFPB oversee the credit bureaus, and so we did that. And so now we have had a regular ongoing supervision program 
um, with respect to um, the largest consumer reporting agencies. And indeed, we have found, and we did um, a special report on this, a supervisory highlights report in March 2017, um, and I, don't, I probably won't go into the details here, but indeed we have found that that kind of oversight and that kind of um, ongoing look by a regulator to see what they were doing to proactively try to comply with the law has resulted in them increasing their quality management uh, in various respects. And so that kind of oversight, that kind of asking the questions, that kind of expectation and evaluation of compliance management, um, we think uh, has made a difference. It's not the complete or total answer, but we think that has made a difference and has been um, a good start. But in addition, it's not just the consumer reporting agencies. The Bureau has been able to look holistically at the whole system. So. Um, many of the inputs are at issue for the credit reporting system, the banks and the non-banks that furnish the data to the credit bureaus, and we can look at that too. We can look at the largest banks um, and their furnishing practices and whether they were complying with the Fair Credit Reporting Act responsibilities they had, as well as the key non-banks. Um, that would be mortgage companies, credit card issuers, debt collectors. Um, and so we were able to look at different aspects of it to make sure we're covering it all. And indeed, we found um, with many of the depository institutions, um, they had not really prioritized um, looking at compliance with their furnishing activities. They hadn't really been overseen for that. So guess what? That was a little bit of a compliance backwater. And, and we put a spotlight on that. We've looked at that. We found some violations, have cited those violations, and um, have, have directed them to improve their compliance. Um, so that's just one example of the kinds of um, observations we've had and the difference this ongoing oversight um, makes in, in my view and in my experience. So just a little bit about the technology picture, um, turning to that. So um, as I mentioned, uh, many financial institutions, many uh, entities of all types, um, increasingly uh, use technology to facilit facilitate their processes and procedures, and in this case, compliance. Um, and so we found that um, um, some of that is, is um, really facilitated by service providers that set up compliance systems for all kinds of different entities. And one key provision um, that's, I think, little known and little understood in Dodd-Frank that was in there is that the Bureau has the ability to go look and directly at the service providers. And that has been, I think, very important in this technology area where we can go kind of to the heart of who's providing the te technology to maybe a number of entities. And if there's a root cause issue, we can uh, detect it and assess it and, again, um, direct them to fix it. Um, we can also just have the same expectations over them that I talked about with the other entities to try to ensure that they proactively pay attention to all the technological details that might come into play when, say, a regulation changes and there needs to be change management uh, properly executed and tested. Um, and so that's been, um, that's been an important part about what we, of what we've done in looking at those technology issues. So I think I'll stop there. Eric? Thank you, Peggy. Next, we'll hear from Nick Smith. Uh, he's the Senior Deputy Attorney General and Assistant Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection of the Pennsylvania Office of the Attorney General. Thanks, Eric. It's a mouthful, and Nick. <laughs> <laughs> it's too long. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Michael, for having us here today. Uh, thank you for letting me come work for you at Treasury <laughs> in 2009. And Peggy and Eric, thank you for uh, giving me my first job. Um, <laughs> So I, I started at Treasury and worked there with, with these good folks, um, and then I went to the CFPB and I was an enforcement attorney there for four and a half years. Um, and then I went into private practice because I wanted to move back to Pittsburgh where I'm from. Um, did that for a little while, and for the past year and a half I've been with Attorney General Josh Shapiro running his Consumer Financial Protection Unit. Um, some people refer to us as a mini CFPB, that would be less of a mouthful, I think, than my <laughs> official title. Um, but I, I really enjoy the work at the state level. And today I'm going to talk about two things. One is sort of what state AGs are doing to fill the gap with the federal agencies perhaps doing less uh, in terms of consumer protection. And then second, um, I want to talk about what we did when I was at the Bureau that involved uh, technology and, and changing technology. Um, 
So I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the first thing, which is the U.S. bank case at the CFPB. And <clears throat> this ties in nicely with what Peggy just told you about exams, because um, back in the early days of the CFPB, uh, in, in Rich, Rich's tenure, um, we actually assigned enforcement attorneys to go out on exams and provide exam support. Um, and the official purpose of that was to give enforcement attorneys experience learning about the exam process, and I think it was a really, really great thing. Um, the, in the entities hated it, and the industry rebelled, and, and Rich probably d didn't hear about anything more than that for about six months. And so finally, um, the Bureau decided not to send enforcement attorneys out on exams anymore. But I had the good fortune of being assigned to an exam of U.S. Bank, um, which was a special review to look at this program called the U.S. Miles Program. And it ended up becoming an enforcement action, which is why I can talk about it with you today. Otherwise, exams are totally confidential. Um, but it was, uh, it was a program that was designed for enlisted service members. It was called Miles. And to the bank's credit, I, I don't want to give them too bad of a name. Um, it was actually a program set up by another bank, which they had acquired. And it was one of those examples of a situation where these big banks were gobbling up lots of smaller banks and non-banks and not necessarily paying much attention to what was going on. So this program um, was a subprime auto loan, very high interest rates, like 17, 18 percent APR. Um, and they had, I think, about 50,000 customers uh, over the course of about a decade. Um, and we looked at it because we got a complaint, and there's a video probably still on the CFPB's website from a, a father of a, a soldier, um, and his father wrote into the CFPB and said, you know, my son is spending basically all of his after-tax income on this car loan. Uh, he had, I think, a $500 payment monthly, and, and it was, like, you know, a brand-new pickup truck, of course. Um, and then he was spending two or $300 on insurance, the rest on gas, and his whole take-home pay was like $1,100. So he really didn't have much money to spend other than the truck. Um, so we we looked at, into the, the program, and the issue that we found um, actually had to do with a lot, a, an allotment program. And allotments are a means of payment that the military set up 100 years ago, maybe longer. Um, basically, before the time of online banking, consumers needed to be able to, when they were deployed at war, they needed to be able to make sure their bills still got paid. And so service members could direct the DOD pay office to pay their mortgage, uh, you know, their, their financing for their horse and buggy, um, <laughs> you know, their, their mother, like whoever they wanted to send payments to. And this system existed for a long time and worked fine. But flash forward to the 2000s, where now everybody in the military is required to have a bank account, and almost every bank offers free online bill pay and free ACH transfers. Um, this, uh, this allotment system was obsolete and not, really not necessary anymore. Um, but there was a whole industry around military bases that had cropped up that figured out that if they required service members to pay via allotment, um, they would basically eliminate any risk that they would not get paid because they would get paid straight out of the paycheck. And even though a service member could turn off the allotment, there's a real um, emphasis for junior enlisted on paying your bills and not falling behind. And you can lose your security clearance if you get a bad uh, thing on your credit report. So there are still today a lot of shady lenders and creditors outside military bases. But before our case, they all required payment by allotment. And it made it much easier for them to prey on service members. Um, U.S. Bank's Miles program did the same thing. You were expected and required to pay with an allotment. And um, the problem that we found that U.S. Bank was doing was they had uh, a third-party service provider that was processing and setting up the allotments and charging service members a $3.50 monthly fee for that, that service. Um, they were not disclosing that fee as part of the Truth in Lending Act disclosure. And without getting into too much technical detail, Basically, this was an extra $200 over the course of the auto loan that, that service members were not being told about up front uh, as part of the cost of the loan. And that was a violation of TILA. Um, so that was one of the findings. We also had some deceptive marketing of add-on products 
Uh, they had a, a vehicle service contract, an extended warranty basically that they were selling, and also gap insurance. And their call center in Kentucky was was calling people and telling them it's it's just pennies a day to have this extra product and you might as well buy it. And in fact, the cost wasn't pennies a day. It was like 40 cents a day or something, which is significantly more than pennies. Um, so we found that was a, a deceptive uh, practice. And we ended up taking two uh, consent orders, one with US Bank. I think they paid about three and a half million dollars back to service members. And then another one with uh, Dealers Financial Services, which was the non-bank marketing partner that had the call center in Kentucky. Um, and uh, we required them to, to give, you know, $7 million in total back to service members, including the one whose father had complained to us in, in the early days. Um, is that on the complaint database? Or com it, it is, yeah. It's probably <laughs> in the complaint database. Um, Served a purpose. And like I said, there's a great video. I think his name is Ari. Um, there's a video of the, of the father and the son uh, that, that the CFPB made. And I think Elizabeth Warren made a video, too. Um, but anyway, the, the reason I mention this case is because we didn't just stop there with the, the settlement and, and requiring them to give the money back. I, was, um, I worked with Holly Petraeus in the early days at the Bureau, and she led the Office of Service Member Affairs. And of course, she was very interested in this case, and we kept her team apprised as it was moving along. And afterwards, um, when we announced the, the settlements, um, she used that to go to the Pentagon and say, hey, look at this allotment program. This, this service member was, had to pay an extra $200 because of this, this allotment program. And you've got all these shady lenders around bases that are taking advantage of the allotment program. You should really take a hard look at allotments and think about if it's still worth having. And so um, the Pentagon set up a working group. I was the policy lead for the CFPB. And we had Holly and, and Seth Frotman on her team. Um, and a long, make a long story short, it took many meetings, but we convinced the Pentagon to ban the use of allotments for consumer credit. Um, it, they still exist for, I think, like paying rent and a couple other small things. I think you can still pay your mortgage through an allotment, but um, you can't make a, pay a car loan or purchase any uh, jewelry or other product outside a military base and repay it through allotments. So that was, um, I think, a good example of the CFPB embracing innovation um, back under under Cordray. I know now the CFPB is making a new push with, with a sandbox and, and other things that they claim will, will help consumer-friendly innovation, and maybe we'll talk about them later. But um, I think it's important to point out that the CFPB has always been in favor of innovation that's actually good for consumers. And in that case, we actively said, here's this old system that's not good for consumers. Let's do away with it and encourage people to use the free bill pay and online banking that is, is much better for them um, that, than the old system. Uh, so I want to shift to state AGs filling the gap. A lot of people are writing articles about how state AGs are beefing up consumer financial protection efforts, and, it, and it's true. We are. Um, I think the CFPB is irreplaceable. and. It is still doing incredibly important work, and, and I was happy to hear from Peggy this morning that much of the exam work is still going on and, and, and strong. And um, I mean, the AGs cannot replace the CFPB, but what we can do is we can be on the, on the cutting edge, I think, take on the cases that may be ones that the new director is not willing to take on and not willing to bring. And, and we have seen that the number of enforcement actions has dropped dramatically since uh, Acting Director Mulvaney and Director Kraninger uh, took over. Um, so a couple things we're working on. One is the Navient lawsuit. Um, that's one where we, the CFPB has a, an ex outstanding case against Navient. They filed in January of 2017. Um, there are also five state AG lawsuits against Navient. Um, and I think that's a good example of somewhere that the CFPB is still doing really good work. I mean, their case is still moving. They're litigating it really hard against the lawyers on the other side. Um, they're, they're doing great work on discovery. They're, and they're a good partner to the states, and I want to I recognize that. Um, at the same time, the states are working very hard as well on our own lawsuits because we recognize um, that the CFPB lawsuit, something could happen to it. I mean, there has been public speculation in the media about meetings with the CEO of Navient. 
Um, so we are hopeful that the CFPB will keep up its, its good work on that case, but we're not counting our chickens and we're, um, we're pursuing our lawsuits as though they're the only ones out there and, and we need to do that. Um, so that's an exciting case. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the substantive allegations there. Um, there's also Equifax. Uh, everyone knows the, there's a multi-state investigation of the Equifax data breach that the AGs are, are working on. Um, that's an exciting one. And I, I think I'll just explain what a multi-state is because some people may not know. Um, back in the 90s, state AGs started working together in a very formal way um, to investigate the tobacco companies. And they institutionalized this process of actually um, banding together and sharing resources and, and signing common interest agreements. And it's become a really powerful way for AGs to do work against these big national uh, entities. And it's particularly helpful for smaller AG offices where they may only have five people in consumer protection for the whole state. Um, so Equifax is an example of that where, of course, every state is, is interested in that case. Another good example of that was Wells Fargo. Um, we announced the settlement in December of 2018. Uh, $550 million was, uh, was paid to the states. And this stemmed from the cases of the, the accounts, the uh, unnecessary accounts that people created, and also the force placed auto insurance. Um, that was a case where the CFPB had done its own actions. They settled one uh, in April of 2018. And uh, we, we took a look at that and we thought we need to do our own. Uh, there's, there's, there's more to be done there. Um, and the public settlement um, includes some findings that went beyond what the CFPB found. Uh, and it was, a, it was a good example, I think, of Wells Fargo realizing like, okay, the AGs, they're gonna, they're gonna hold our feet to the fire. And I, there's a lot I can't talk about that's confidential there, um, but suffice it to say that I think the AG's involvement was, was very helpful in that, in that matter. Um, another, another case that I wanna mention that's just a, a smaller one, but which is, is a fun one, is the, the Dominion Cash Point case. Um, so this is an example of where state AGs try to stop some of the, the cross-border stuff that goes on. Um, in Pennsylvania, we have a usury limit, like many states. So payday lending is effectively illegal in Pennsylvania. And there's a company called Dominion Cash Point that was based in Delaware and was making usurious title loans to consumers from Pennsylvania. They were advertising in Pennsylvania. They had uh, a website directed toward Pennsylvania borrowers with, with PA in the URL. Um, <laughs> and they encouraged Pennsylvanians to just drive across the border to Delaware and take out a title loan. Um, the company has gone out of business, but we sued them because uh, they took five million dollars from Pennsylvania borrowers, and we want them to pay back the legal interest portion of that, which is about three million dollars. So um, this was my first state court case. I only got to work on federal cases at the bureau, and Navient is also filed in federal court. So. I got to learn about the procedures of the Philadelphia court system. Um, and fortunately, I have good lawyers in our Philly office to, to tutor me along the way, and I'm constantly bugging them about how that works. But um, you know, th this is a case where the owners took all this money from consumers. Um, they've now squirreled it away in trusts, and uh, they're trying to keep it in, away from our, our hands. Um, and we realized that they just weren't gonna, gonna give us the money unless we sued them. And so now we're in discovery in that case. It's a very fast timeline, I think scheduled for trial like later this year. Um, so that's an example of the kind of thing the AGs can do and have to do where you might not see the CFPB suing such a small company, although some of the RESPA actions were against pretty small companies. Um, but the AGs, we have to take on people at all different levels from the biggest Wells Fargo to to the really smaller ones. Um, and Dominion's not even the smallest. We do home improvement contractor cases where there's like 10 people who got bad plumbing lines put in their basement. Um, I don't work on those cases. I only do consumer finance, but that's what the AG consumer protection offices have to do. So um, I guess I just, wanna, I just wanna close by emphasizing what I said before, which is we can't replace the CFPB, but 
we're doing our best. We're, we're shifting resources away from the plumbers and towards the Wells Fargo's. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. Uh, I know other states are doing the same thing. Um, I'm going out to, to New Jersey to help talk to them about what they can do. What they, they, they've got some new folks there, and they're really excited to do more in consumer finance. Um, I'm going to visit with the Michigan AG's office in the coming months, uh, the new AG here. So, um, you know, I think there's interest all over the country in terms of doing more in consumer financial protection. And as long as we keep working hard, uh, I think we can survive the next two to four years until we have a new director of the CFPB. Thanks, Nick. Lisa Donner is next and with us. She's the executive director of the Americans for Financial Reform. And thanks, Michael, uh, for inviting me. Um, maybe uh, I should I should start by saying it's, it's uh, there are a lot of people in this room who played a huge role from the inside in uh, building the Consumer Bureau at different stages of its of its life. And I feel like we and our partners played a played a role from the outside. But maybe that makes it easier for me to say uh, as a as a framing uh, device that though we clearly are facing a bunch of challenges right now with the change in leadership of the bureau, I do think it's really important to. Um, take a moment and celebrate actually what a huge success um, the Bureau has been and what a difference it has made in consumer protection, what a difference it has made in changing the rules and changing the extent to which institutions feel like they have to follow the rules, and what a difference is made in actually leaving us, despite the challenges of this moment, in a stronger position, I think, to keep doing better than that, um, both on consumer regulation and, frankly, on financial regulation beyond that. Uh, so I do, I do think that's worth celebrating and important to celebrate. And I don't say that at all to say, you know, our work is done, I think, even apart from the challenges of the moment. First, I think one of the really important lessons of uh, the history of the Bureau and of the fights around it has been that we need to set the bar higher um, in terms of what we expect and demand on consumer financial regulation and on outcomes for people and on financial regulation generally. Um, and so we should be satisfied for that reason. And then also, I mean, people have talked about a little about Wells here, but thinking about an institution like that where on the one hand there's been some good regulatory work and some good kind of speaking up from below on the part of the workers. And uh, some changes have been forced, and yet uh, we have this giant institution that where you know every time you look, there is another round of really troubling abuses in a different part of the business. And so clearly we haven't solved the problem of, of making fundamental change at, a, at an institution like that that touches so many lives. All right, so first, um, a couple comments on, on what worked, uh, I, uh, and then, or some contributions to the discussion of what worked, then on some of the, the, the frightening things happening at the moment, uh, and then a little on, on what next. Um, you know, uh, stating the, the obvious to an audience that knows this well, but uh, the, the Bureau in, it, in this first phase of it, in the first phase of its life, did what it was supposed to do, right? It used the set of tools that it was given uh, and the um, sort of structural features that were baked into it uh, to uh, uh, pursue its mission, and that added up to a significant impact, including the $12 billion in consumer relief that we talk about all the time, but it's more than that, right, because of practices that got changed by those enforcement actions, so it wasn't just the $12 million to, to those people. Um, and include and significant rulemakings that both stopped major harms, uh, like the kind of lending that was at the root of the crisis, um, and set guardrails for m sort of more emerging products and markets, like in the prepaid uh, space. Uh, incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, Eric talked a little bit about the sort of structural features and the design of the Bureau, and I think Mike's going to talk a little bit more about some uh, particular rules and market changes as examples of this. So I wanted to talk a second about more of sort of the choices, uh, process and structural choices that the Bureau made that helped uh, enable the some of those successes that I think are useful lessons for effective regulation. And I think we should spend the time uh, to talk more to the people who know this stuff much better than me, the people on the inside, to think through uh, some of these lessons as well. I think the focus on being consumer-facing and treating consumers 
as the agency's constituency in building structures and processes to maintain that mission focus uh, are incredibly important. Uh, you know, so the failures, and Eric talked about this in the, in the bank regulatory world to do this, were partially about mission, uh, not having a consumer protection mission uniquely, uh, but not only, I mean, the SEC has a very substantial consumer protection mission that it has often failed to pay much attention to that element of its mission. And minding safety and, and soundness um, ought to be uh, not just about uh, uh, minding it from the perspective of each individual institution, but from the perspective of the system and the public, uh, which is different, a different perspective on safety and soundness. And, and there are a bunch of structural forces that move uh, financial regulators away from a public interest focus, including just the power and money of the banks, and then all the little ways that that's manifest, even when we are being, we sort of the consumer advocacy community are being really active and engaged, there are not as many of us. We're never going to have even a fraction of the meetings, for example, with a friendly regulator uh, that industry does. There's all kinds of data that they have that we don't have. Uh, and so we, we won't, there's no way to understand those things unless a regulator uh, is taking that responsibility and serving the public and doing it. So I think. Uh, for example, the choice to um, not just, I mean, the, the complaint database was a statutory requirement, but making it public uh, was a choice. And then move, taking the next step to make the narratives public uh, was a choice. And all those things, I think, kind of lock in a virtuous cycle of the database is more attractive to people if they can learn something from it as well as use it. And it's certainly more effective in shaping bank uh, actions if they know people are going to see what they did or didn't do. And I think that... You know, I, you hear from all kinds of people, including uh, you know people who talk to industry about what their response to it has been, or attorneys who it's sort of funny for a lawyer who has all those tools to, you know, say, yeah, but actually we get better results sometimes. But you know, when my client files a complaint because they know it's going to be seen, then you know, through months of, of litigation, uh, doing things like holding public hearings around the country to talk about substantive issues and hear from people, doing things like publishing supervisory highlights. So th because each individual supervisory process is private, but telling the public what is happening in those uh, exams, I think, is incredibly important and gives you a sense of what the agency is, is doing and how you might affect change. And, you know, certainly we said to lots of other agencies, like, you could do something like that. It, on the Volcker rule, for example, you could tell us what you're seeing and it would make a difference. I think using uh, enforcement actions to both, you know, make sure you're getting money back for, for people in meaningful ways and to change con conduct and to educate both the public um, and institutions about what the law is and the expectation that it will be followed. Willingness to go after big and sometimes small actors when they're doing exotic things, but just because the practice was widespread, not to make, have that mean that you had to let it go. Um, and using research and reports uh, really effectively, both to inform rule writing and to shape the conversation. Um, um, and expose problems, uh, as for example, as it was done so successfully in student lending. So that's, uh, that's sort of a piece of the, of the good news. Um, in terms of where we are uh, now, uh, first, um, I think it's true at the same time that uh, though the folks in charge, I think, you know, essentially don't believe the Bureau should exist and don't agree with its mission, uh, they can't just wish it away, right? Um, there's, there's an institution there and they can't make it go away. Uh, and that's a good thing. That doesn't mean they, they can't do a, a bunch of, of harm. So I want to talk about a couple of the, the pieces of what we are most worried about uh, that is happening right now. Um, one piece is a real change uh, in the approach to enforcement. And obviously, we, don't, we can't see a bunch of that because you don't, can't see what doesn't happen. But you, or you can't see the details of what doesn't happen. But you can see some numbers about what doesn't happen. And, and our colleague at CFA, <coughs> Chris Peterson actually just looked, did, a, did an exhaustive counting uh, in the last couple of weeks of um, enforcement actions before, before and after the change in leadership. Um, and uh, the, uh, in, in the uh, peak enforcement year, which was 2015, uh, there were 55 uh, enforcement actions brought. Uh, last year, there were 11. Uh, the average uh, recovery or, or money back for consumers in those cases uh, when Director Cordray was in charge was, clo was close to 57 million per case. Uh, Kreinich has only been there a moment, so this is not a, quite a fair number, uh, but 2.4 million uh, 
for those cases. So about 43 million in, restitu in restitution for each week of Cordray's tenure, 6.4 million under Mulvaney. There were a bunch of legacy cases still to, again, it's not been very long yet, but 925,000 a week uh, under the present director. Uh, 15 student lending cases versus none, 11 cases of lending discrimination of one kind or another versus none. So that's a big change. The undermining of the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity by stripping it of law enforcement authority and kind of repurposing it to advocacy, coordination, and education uh, rather than demanding compliance with the law. Closing the office for students and young consumers uh, and sort of reassigning that staff to serve within the Office of Financial Education and then turning around the rulemaking agenda um, so that instead of a focus on consumer protection rules, a lot of the rulemaking energy has been focused on sort of uh, reversing consumer protection, um, including uh, notably, obviously, in the things not done, uh, taking the over an overdraft rule off the agenda of things to do, taking the small business data collection rule off the agenda of things to do, uh, rolling back, proposing to roll back the payday rule, uh, and putting out for proposal this uh, sandbox proposal that, uh, that Nick referred to, which uh, we think is, is an incredibly dangerous uh, uh, proposal um, that would, if, if it goes forward as it, as it was written, it essentially would allow individual employees uh, without, in, in 60 days, the agency's giving itself 60 days to respond to requests for sweeping exemptions and exceptions um, with no public input <laughs> um, and very little visibility. Uh, no requirement that the company not currently be facing litigation or enforcement actions. They're willing to accept applications from trade associations or to service providers who serve whole markets, not just individual providers. So it's sort of a, gi it's a giant loophole to almost anything or everything uh, with no process, uh, which seems like an astoundingly dangerous as, as well as, uh, you know, extreme case of overreach uh, uh, proposal. And then um, earlier, I guess, the, you know, the last sort of, it not, not, wasn't a rulemaking, but a, uh, a lot of time and energy, uh, it felt like got spent when, when Mulvaney first came to the Bureau on this, R, this request for information process, um, requesting comment on a whole bunch of very process uh, but very important process issues about the Bureau uh, that felt like an exercise in um, inviting <coughs> industry to, you know, write its, compl write its complaints down. And, you know, we, we had the opportunity to comment as well, but they were, the questions were often very vague or very broad. There was very little time. Their questions was very difficult to respond to if you didn't have the perspective of somebody who had been inside the process and it's not clear what's happening uh, with regard to those RFIs. So just sort of an ex another example of a, a great deal of energy being expended on deregulation, really, not regulation, and a series of like, you know, warning flags on uh, things to watch out for in terms of change. I mean, some of the, cha the cha changes suggested included like stopping sharing information, for example, um, making it, putting up barriers to make it more difficult to effectively use what you learn with one piece of information gathering to take action to, to change those practices. So how do we think about our job um, in the, I guess may, maybe one last thing to say here um, <coughs> on the, to do my one sentence on the, on the FinTech front. Um, I would say one of the things that uh, I think is particularly worrisome um, in this moment is the is things under the banner of, of fintech that's partially what the sandbox is being characterized as and it's not that financial technology is necessarily bad by any by any means or that there can't be good new products um, or that there it can't there can't be good reasons to be interested in innovation uh, but uh, it does feel like the word fintech or innovation is being used as kind of a generic fairy dust that you sprinkle on anything and that's an excuse to not have to look too closely and a reason to not be regulated. Um, and it also seems like um, it is true that there's, there can be a particular lack of visibility for some products that um, happen substantially online and so it's a context in which we're, the public is even more dependent on an effective regulator uh, to make sure that we have fair outcomes. And so it's particularly worrisome to not have that confidence at a time when new products are being developed and decisions are being made. 
all that, I'm going to return to my cheerful perspective um, <laughs> for a second. All, all that said, um, uh, it does feel like uh, we are in a good, because of the work of the Bureau and because of the organizing work outside of it, we actually are in a fair position to resist uh, all of these changes. I don't expect that the sandbox proposal will be finalized uh, as written and prevail. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we have been in an incredibly defensive position with posture on the Hill for a long time, and we've had two years of, of hostility from both houses of Congress and the administration, and yet managed to not see any fundamental structural changes uh, in the Bureau. And that's because I think the sort of initial theory that the way to, the way to protect it for the long term was to not to be timid and careful, but to be careful to do the right thing. Um, and to have an impact was right. And because having an agency where the facts matter um, and where the voices of consumers matter uh, is useful for making policy change, but it's also useful for our organizing because it gives us a reason to keep making those arguments and keep uh, organizing those voices. And that has helped us not only with regard to the Bureau, but with regard to Congress and to the broader public. Uh, so I think we're in a, we just are in a stronger position because of having had those, uh, those public conversations uh, than we would be had we not, had we not done so. Um, uh, as evidenced, for example, by not having had the payday rule overturned by a, by a CRA, right? That was a real, a real risk and a real, uh, a real win. So I think we clearly have plenty of defensive work to do, but I think we also have an opportunity uh, to be ambitious, um, both about solutions and about how we describe the problems and make sure that we don't get stuck in kind of a narrow view of what consumer protection is, but that we frame what is at stake as what it is, which is that these are really fundamental matters of people's economic security, their health, their happiness, their homes, um, and also are fundamental to their fundamentals of justice and, and, and decency. Is our financial system punishing people for being poor or for being in some other way vulnerable? Is it increasing inequality or in, is it adding to the corrosive wealth, racial wealth gap or are we demanding that it do something different than that? And that's a conversation that we can, we can prevail around um, if, we, if we continue to have it loudly. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Lisa. Mike Calhoun, president of the Center Responsible Lending, will be our last panelist. So thank you again to Michael and the organizers of this conference. And, and I think just to put a, a, you really are fortunate here to have the architects and the builders of the CFPB and of Dodd-Frank here today. Uh, Michael was the point person for the administration uh, and at the very front line as well as uh, the, the general, if you will, of this whole campaign. So I wanted to start by giving a little background on the Center for Responsible Lending uh, because it ties into my comments, which will be in three areas. First, a little more detail about how out of whack the system was. Uh, before the crisis and before CFPB. It's more on some of the changes and some examples, as Lisa mentioned, uh, about very successful transformations, really, of how areas and products work. And then finally, some of the future issues, uh, including some future cautions. So the Center for Responsible Lending is the policy arm of self-help credit unions, which was started in 1980. They're a CFDI, Community Financial Development Institution, and we were founded to address the racial wealth gap, which in 1980 was uh, 10 times as much wealth on average for white households as for black households, and today it stands there and, and is headed in the wrong direction still. Uh, our initial focus was on small business lending and in mortgage lending, so uh, we did uh, a lot of mortgage lending. Today we operate about 60 branches, uh, have about 150,000 retail customers around the country where we provide the full range of consumer finances, everything from bank accounts, credit cards, home mortgages, and then as well as consumer mortgages. 
and how we got into the policy branch was our it was in the late 1990s and we had the experience of borrowers that we had put into home loans come back to us on the brink of foreclosure and we looked at these loans they had and they were truly unbelievable um, they would have double digit interest rates 10 points or more of upfront fees uh, credit insurance thrown in at outrageous terms and as Eric mentioned they were totally uh, uh, legal at the time and so we tend to be a wonky group uh, some people have said you know a well-designed spreadsheet is our uh, vision of beauty and self-help <laughs> <laughs> so we set out as we tend to do and uh, sent out interns and lawyers and researched uh, the registered deeds offices around the state to see how widespread is this just a handful of folks and did some other research and the results were pretty astounding so uh, at the macro level we found that in North Carolina uh, the leading subprime lender at the time the associates had 88 offices in North Carolina alone now we're a decent sized state but that is a bunch of offices the other thing we learned was this company was an affiliate, a division at the time, uh, and a tie to where we are today, a Ford Motor Company. And it was so wildly profitable, this division was making more money than the entire rest of the company, including all the car building and selling at the time so this is you know they wrap this up and oh this is about access this was all about the money and the extraordinary stunt, uh, uh, sums of it and then finally and I'll tie this in to another point uh, we found looking at the registered deeds that in the course of about three years these folks had refinanced one in five of the Habitat for Humanity homeowners out of their zero interest mortgages into these unbelievably abusive mortgages and you would ask why would anybody ever give up their zero interest mortgage turned out these were their perfect target because these were overwhelmingly refinanced loans to people who were struggling to make it month to month and the Habitat for Humanity owners were house poor. They had home equity, very small income. They had other credit, credit cards, installment loans. At that time, payday loans were legal in North Carolina, thankfully no more. And the sales pitch was, refinance your home with us. We'll catch you up on all your debts. We're going to refinance all of that into your home. Sign the papers. You don't have to bring any cash to closing. But buried in all that fine print is you just lost all your home equity. And so Habitat, when they learned of this, quickly took steps to block that. But the point about the crisis, and two things, just the depth of the crisis, as Michael and the others in the administration knew, we were within like a week or two of people not getting their paychecks. That They did not publicize that because of the panic it would have created. But the extraordinary steps that were taken were not just because we're going to have some banks fail, but it was going to be an, a deep economic winter where people couldn't buy food next week. I mean, we were that close to the precipice. And the crazy thing was this was not just an avoidable crisis. It was an enabled crisis by the people who were supposed to stop it. So, so let me give you an example. So just... Uh, first, how out of whack this system is, so you understand how we ended up there. In, in the lingo of, of, of agencies, these financial regulators were, were what you would call captured agencies, meaning the industries they were supposed to regulate uh, really controlled them. And in this sense, it was literally true to an extraordinary extent. So, uh, as Eric explained, uh, you were, you could sometimes, you could pick which agency would be your regulator. So in particular, in the world of banks, you got to pick 
whether the uh, national general national bank regulator, the OCC, Office of Control of Currency, or the Office of Thrift Supervision was your regulator. And this took on big importance for the agencies because the agencies, and this was designed to give them independence, but it had this perverse effect, their budgets were paid 100% by the fees of the banks that they regulate. And so there was this uh, uh, famous moment uh, where Countrywide, uh, which became a very substantial bank, uh, thought that the OCC was deigning to perhaps constrain some of their reckless mortgage lending. And so they said basically, so long, we're moving to the OTS. And by the way, that's one-fourth of your overall agency budget that's going with us. And that sent shock waves, shock waves through the agencies. It was, we want to remind you who's boss here and don't forget it. And, and it did. And literally, and, and although this still happens today, in public speaking and in written documents, the bank agencies referred to the banks as their customers. And they competed by who could best serve and defend their customers. And so you saw this happen in a couple ways. So, for example, um, <clears throat> the uh, OCC and other agencies did this too. Uh, rather than, as you've heard Nick describe, working with states, they served as defenders of their banks against state enforcement actions. The most well-known of these were, was with Providian a subprime uh, credit card company and the California AG did an extensive uh, investigation found uh, uh, widespread abuses and the OCC came in and said we'll take over the investigation and then entered into a sweetheart settlement with them that they saw themselves that was a service that they provided uh, to their customers um, the OCC, by statute, has a good bit of discretion about uh, preempting state laws and saying banks, national banks, don't have to comply with state laws. Um, in the case of the mortgages and abusive mortgages, the states were starting to notice this problem. And so we worked in 1999, North Carolina passed the first state predatory lending law and it had some tough provisions. We passed other ones, worked with groups. Lisa was involved in passing a number of these. And ultimately, close to two dozen of these laws were passed. So the response of the OCC in, in, uh, in response to their request from their customers uh, was to issue uh, rules saying that national banks did not have to comply with any of these state law protections against abusive mortgages. And that not only protected them, it created an uneven playing field. And so the state chartered banks started going to state legislatures and saying, we want parity. If the national banks get exemption, you can't treat us local banks worse than the national banks can do. And then the non-banks. And so you got this race to the bottom uh, on the scope of regulation there. And then uh, going back to uh, our habitat example. Uh, the Federal Reserve was, uh, in a 1992 law, was given the responsibility and the authority to protect against abusive mortgage refinancing by any entity, bank or non-bank. And they dipped their toe in this water once, and this was in early 2000. They were kind of ashamed about, we were beating them and others pretty hard about this time. They were kind of ashamed about the habitat refinancing because, you know, that people work for habitat volunteer. People were pretty outraged. So they proposed a rule uh, that would put restrictions on refinancing of zero interest mortgages from nonprofits or, uh, or from governmental entities, which were widespread. Pretty modest step. They decided it was a leap too far, though, and withdrew the proposed rule. It took no action whatsoever to protect those borrowers. Uh, after 
having a record showing the abuses there. The other thing that was done was there was a, basically a, an unwritten but widely recognized rule uh, within the within these um, regulators would be the only standards that they would issue were vague aspirational statements because their fear was that um, you know, first of all the bank the banks wanted to have a loose standard that they would be judged by by the supervisor but also under uh, the legal standards you could use national bank rules as an example and states did this in private litigants as too could be evidence that something was an unfair trade practice mm -hmm. and so the banks didn't want any standards there by the regulators that could be used by state AGs or private litigants and so for example the OCC response on uh, these predatory loans was to say uh, banks should not charge unreasonable fees that was that was as far as they went uh, and and the banks were adamant that they should not have anything close to a bright line standard which is as we'll talk about a little later when they had a real enforcer like Director Cordray, they suddenly wanted very specific <laughs> standards <laughs> that limited how far. And, and uh, yeah, so it's amazing how, how much <laughs> it changed. Um, so the, with all this going on, the other thing I'll say real quickly, uh, is CRL, that this was, there was a lot of evidence a lot of people knew that this was the house of cards that was going to collapse crl using industry data published a report in 2006 where we said there would be uh two well over two million foreclosures of subprime loans and that we thought that was a a, a very low estimate uh, the response of industry was to request a, C a, a gao study uh, against us for so disrupting uh, this well-functioning mortgage market <laughs> for those of you who saw the big short it really is accurate Lisa has a close friend who was the prime uh, uh, character in the big short and that it really was that crazy at ground level so you would think after the economy goes to the edge of the abyss and all this that industry would be a little chastened that there would be this consensus that we needed to change things. Welcome to Washington, D.C. <laughs> so not said is the, the, the Dodd-Frank Act passed, but industry vilified, not all of them, let me be clear, but to a very large extent, vilified the effort and Michael Barr. I remember industry members coming and saying, that Michael Barr, the gall of him, we asked for changes in the bill, and he says, well, will you support the bill if I give you the changes? And then he won't give them to us unless we're going to support the bill. And they're like, the gall of him. <laughs> and I had that happen on multiple occasions. So, um, and the bill ultimately passes by a razor-thin margin. I mean, it was down to the very last votes. Um, so that is, that is the state of where we were when the CFPB was passed. And for us, and within our shop, we talk about creation of CFPB is similar to the creation of the EPA and how it really was a milestone in how this country looked at the environmental problems, a recognition of the impact of it and the need of coordinated scope. And it really, uh, even in unfriendly administrations, it really has changed how the country looks at environmental regulation. And so going quickly, because I want to leave time uh, for questions from this uh, quite knowledgeable and expert audience, the changes uh, really were sea changes, particularly when you look back at just how amazingly dysfunctional uh, uh, the system was. And then the other part of it, which about the welcome to, to Washington, you also had what, what were considered captured uh, committees. So the, the way you do things in Washington, if, if you're a uh, bank, 
you give all your political contributions to the banking committee members and leadership. And so uh, the banking committee members are expected to primarily raise their campaign contributions from the industry that they regulate. In fact, there are even some committees where you only can get on one because they're so lucrative for fundraising. Uh, and so it's very hard to get anything through uh, uh, those committees. So for example, the Military Lending Act did not go through the normal committee structure because it wouldn't have made it through. We couldn't get a hearing through the major committee structures. It went through as an amendment to the Defense Appropriations Act. And so it went through Armed Services, and I'll give a shout out, which not always, to Senator Shelby, who signed off on it and did not require it to go through his committee because uh, he, he, he knew it wouldn't get through his committee and he wanted it to pass. So the, the big change is the non-bank supervision is a huge sea change because so much of the bad activity was there and that is still continuing. The public uh, complaint database, uh, likewise, uh, we talk with lenders and most of the major banks have official programs designed to prevent uh, complaints from customers from escalating to a complaint being filed with the Bureau. And so that's part of what Lisa was describing and, and Nick, that people find that filing these complaints uh, with the Bureau is, is remarkably effective and simply raising the threat of filing a complaint with the Bureau is very effective uh, within the institutions uh, themselves. Um, the uh, enforcement, as I said, the industry now wants to cabin enforcement by having the rules as specific as possible. And then the AG enforcement. I mean, one of the uh, uh, not widely recognized provisions of Dodd-Frank at the time, the CFPB, was it specifically authorized AGs to enforce the rules and the UDAP authority of the CFPB that was put in there precisely for these times. When we knew, when we were passing uh, working on Dodd-Frank and CFPB, we always said there will be a James Watt uh, head of the CFPB, and, and that's just life in Washington, D.C. For those of you all remember him as uh, head of the interior, um, where he was pretty much wanted to nullify the agency at the time. And so it, it, there were safeguards to be built in there to the extent they could. And I want to, you know, the one reform, I think the idea of, of, of blowing up the CFPB uh, is, is unlikely, as Lisa said, but I do want to remind people that you know, two years ago there were open plans of using uh, special procedures, budget reconciliation, to in fact abolish the CFPB and distribute its staffs back to the previous agencies that had been ineffective. Um, it was the great work CFPB had done that made that politically unpopular, uh, as well as a lot of work by groups. I think the only, you know, the two threats that are out there now, I think uh, one that gets less popularity is going to a, a commission rather than a single director. Uh, many of us are very strongly against the commission because we have seen that the commissions are sort of the worst of both worlds, that if you, you, the commissions did not do so well under the Obama administration, and they would do just as poorly today, uh, loaded up with uh, appointments from the current administration. Uh, and one of the ironies is the model for the CFPB structure was taken from the regulator of the federal housing finance system, including Fannie and Freddie Mac, uh, uh, Mac and that bill was drafted in large part by Republicans who specifically sought a single director because they knew that's what they needed to have effective accountability and oversight of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who they wanted reined in. And, and so that was closely copied for the CFPB, and I think the same reasoning applies that if you want the effectiveness and accountability. The other is some threat 
that they would try and put it under appropriations, which would hugely weaken it because then you get budget riders. So, if, for example, in this whole housing crisis, Lisa talked about and Nick talked about the, you know, the mortgage brokers were selling these loans and got incentives. They got paid twice as much to sell you one of these risky loans as they got if they sold you a standard 30 uh, year fixed rate prime loan. Well, HUD started to regulate that practice. And so the brokers went and got a budget writer put on HUD's budget saying they couldn't regulate the brokers. And so that's another reason why we're so uh, concerned about ever getting to um, appropriated funding. So let me quickly go through a couple of places where, I mean, you've seen real sea changes. One is uh, in mortgage, uh, both origination and servicing. Uh, it is just a totally different world. Mortgages are fundamentally safer. Borrowers are treated fundamentally better. Uh, and most in industry agree that it is a better system. There are places where they want tweaks around the edges, uh, but in general, they think the CFPB was certainly uh, uh, very close to the mark in the regulations there. Another w would be with credit cards, uh, where, as I think you all remember, it was a pretty dysfunctional wild, wild west market, and uh, a couple of the practices were things like the escalating late fees. They were making a third of their total revenues off of fees rather than the interest they charged. They would give you a teaser rate um, and then raise the rate on your balances, and most particularly for borrowers who are less wealthy, it was hard for them to move those balances at the time, so they were just stuck with the higher payment. And then the one that sort of brought it to a head were, were these offers of free financing, zero interest financing for six months or a year. And this is where there's some uh, alignment with industry that the industry worries about the race to the bottom that they saw in the mortgage where if you did not have teaser rates, uh, you could not compete because they look cheaper to borrowers. We actually had credit card companies come to us before Dodd-Frank and ask us to work on credit card legislation because they could not compete fairly with each other and just were cannibalizing each other's business. To, to meet the market employees, they had to make these wild offers. But to make the numbers work, they had to load in fine print so that nobody would actually qualify uh, to achieve all those benefits. And they, they didn't like that for the problem. So to wind up here uh, with some, uh, the, the issues going forward, I think overdraft, student lending, Wade Henderson's gonna talk about student lending is a threat on the magnitude of the subprime mortgage crisis for communities of color. Arbitration, the, the CFPB did its part and put out a rule we need to continue to fight against mandatory arbitration. And then two areas, Lisa uh, uh, has talked about these proposals to change, if you will, how the Bureau operates and what some of the foundational rules are, like what is the scope. The payday rule is in large, uh, the efforts by CFPB to rewind and, and repeal the payday rule is in large part an attempt to rewrite the standard and greatly weaken the standard of what's an unfair, deceptive, abusive trade practice and how do you prove it in, we think, a totally unjustified, illegal way. Um, Another area that cuts across, and maybe one of our speakers, Lisa Rice, will be here uh, tomorrow, is disparate impact. <coughs> that HUD is coming out with a rule that tries to not uh, repeal it, but to make it totally ineffective, which would be a huge setback across the whole board for civil rights enforcement. So sometimes, con in conclusion, sometimes consumer protection is compared, and, and Nick can relate to this is hacking back the jungle, that there is a whole cottage industry coming up with new twists and turns of how do you uh, uh, take advantage of consumers. Uh, these administrative changes, I agree totally with Lisa about how fundamental they have and, and I think how sticky they are. I'm going to end with one cautionary tale about not letting our guard down. In the 19 uh, 70s, for those of us who were doing consumer protection work back then, 
uh, there were two, two events. One was Ralph Nader proposed a consumer protection agency. Uh, it passed uh, one house uh, uh, in 75. The decision was to not compromise because they were going to pass it after Carter got elected. After Carter got elected, industry raised a huge campaign and killed the bill, and it died. At the same time, the FTC uh, wasn't as limited in rulemaking authority uh, when it was originally set up as it is today. In fact, it had vast rulemaking authority in the 70s and undertook a range of rulemaking across uh, funeral services, uh, illegally uh, uh, bundled uh, and deceptively presented, uh, used car sales. They were addressing all of those and the, led by the Chamber of Commerce, they took, essentially took away the rulemaking uh, authority. They limited technically to, quote, judicial rulemaking, which is not the ordinary rulemaking, and it's not been used since. And so uh, these authorities can be taken away. We need to be vigilant because uh, the benefit for, of the CFPB for consumers and the overall economy has been extraordinary, and we need to make sure it continues. Thanks, Mike. Should we open it up to questions to the audience? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Lisa Servon. I wanted to ask a question um, that probably doesn't have a really easy answer. Uh, I'm just at the end of a comparative study of financial inclusion policy in the U.S. and the U.K. And one of the things, there's a lot of similarities in the environment and in terms of even the kinds of agencies and policies that, that have been created to deal with uh, these issues. One of the things that really surprised me the most, though, was the extent to which the firms that are regulated by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority there, approve of the mission and have really bought into it. So I opened my laptop because, so 68% um, of those firms rate the overall effectiveness of the FCA as at between a seven and a 10, 10 being the highest. <laughs> and for those claiming a low effectiveness rating, one to three, 24% said that the FCA should be doing more to prevent wrongdoing. That's why they rated it low. And so it's clearly a really different environment than it is here, even though there's so much similarity in the context. And again, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I wonder if you could just speculate on that and why there isn't more buy-in. Um, I mean, there's, there are obvious answers, but there are obvious answers there too that have not turned out to be the truth in terms of why there's that support. Anybody know anything about the <laughs> FCA? So I will jump in some because payday lending, there, yes. we have a lot of uh, international, uh, you know, payday lending is not so much mom and pa's, it is big international financial companies and a number of those and installment lenders operate in both the UK and the US markets. I mean, I think some of it is you look at the UK and Europe uh, more broadly, is there's an expectation of, uh, of greater government oversight and regulation. And it, I mean, you look across the board, they don't tolerate the interchange fee monopoly that we have here. Uh, their privacy standards are much greater. And so I think a, a lot of it is just a baseline. Yes. There's an expectation among both consumers and industry that there will be rules of the road and you're not out there to defend on your own or do whatever you want. Um, I could add, I'd, I, it's not directly in response to your question, but I think there is support from the banking industry um, for the CFPB looking across bank and non-bank markets that are doing similar things with the same level of oversight through supervision. So previous to the CFPB, there was often this term used that they're not regulated, the non-banks are not regulated, and that always bothered me, because of course they're subject to the same laws and regulations. I think what, what people meant by that is they're not overseen in the same way, in the way I described, where there's someone really kind of overseeing their compliance and trying to ensure that they have 
compliance manager systems uh, in place to try to proactively comply, not just waiting to get caught. And so um, I, I think there is support for that uh, uh, consistent look, and it's particularly important in the mortgage markets with the growth of the non-bank uh, sector in mortgage origination, and that has been the case for a while in mortgage servicing, but that's getting even stronger, I think. Uh, that was great. Um, it's really uh, sort of worrisome to go down History Road like you all have just taken us. Um, the question I have is a couple of them. One, Lisa, you suggested that the CFPB and the efforts behind consumer protection should have actually gone further mm -hmm. than they did in the OMAB administration under the director. It would be great to hear you talk about that. Mike, um, the other night I sat down for entertainment to watch on HBO the untold story of the 2008 financial crises. <laughs> I didn't see you in it, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can, and, and I was watching with somebody who's not in our field, and he's like, didn't the government know what was happening? Like, what, you know, what, how was this not known? And I remember a conference that Ben Bernanke was pointedly asked about in 2007, look what's happening in these low-income communities, and the answer wasn't quite fulfilling at that point. Now that we're 10 years post, what would you say about like what was known, what was ignored, notwithstanding all the points you just made about captive, um, but like, what, what happened? All of you. But Right. Can I actually would want, want to start with that with that second question uh, <laughs> too. Um, Not sure your mic's on. Whoops. Yes. Can you hear? Is it on now? Yeah. Because um, uh, I think I think lots of us have have, th have things to say about what was known, and I do think it's a it's a it's a very important uh, story. And there's a couple pieces of it that feel even more vivid to me in retrospect. Uh, than they than they do at the time. I think, you know, as, as Mike was saying, right, we we it, there was plain as day evidence of the for, of the um, foreclosures that were expanding in those communities, primarily communities of color and low-income communities that had been targeted with predatory loans. Even before those foreclosures started, there was plain as day evidence of the structurally abusive features of the mortgages that were being sold, both on the ability to pay side and on the um, uh, equity extracting high fees uh, and prepayment penalties side and on the, um, the kind of structural incentives to um, screwed up costs created by the way that, by the yield spread premium uh, system and the way that people were paid. So uh, people knew it from their lived experience. They knew it because, or they should have known it because the evidence was not that hard to find. They knew it because they should have known it because people were bringing it to the regulators. And the response from the regulators, in, in my experience, was very often, uh, to sort of refuse to look at the evidence that they had and to say, um, that's just what you're bringing us is just anecdote. Bring us data, uh, which was a particularly terrible answer when they, in fact, could have gotten the data had they chosen to. Um, and HUD did do uh, one, we, were we talked about this last night a second, uh, you know, uh, through much, 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 much advocacy, HUD, di HUD did a report, a uh, pretty modest, careful report, but it, they were never able to make it into anything. Um, and uh, so, there was a, it was a, an extraordinarily willful failure to know because there was so much money being made um, on the other side. It was, it was enormously profitable and people did not want it to stop. And so they didn't, and, the, and, and, and they none didn't of the people. And they that it was going to, get, I mean, because everybody thought prices are going to, valuations are going to keep going up. Yeah, it's hard, I mean, it's hard not to go back to the, like, it, you know, it's hard for people to believe things that they are paid not to not to believe, and that people with fancy degrees and fancy suits um, told them not to believe, and when the, the, pers the people who were hurt first were not their neighbors. Um, it really was financial alchemy, though. I mean, you cannot believe the amount of money, again. So, uh, 
I mean, a quote we often use in our testimony we had from a lender of the business, and he said, I get paid twice as much for doing a no-doc loan as I do for doing a documented loan. Now, wait a second, it's less work, but, and the reason is, because borrowers didn't realize this, the no-doc loans, the option arm loans, uh, the, these 228 loans, all carry higher interest rates than a regular 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage. Borrowers often didn't understand that, but we often found borrowers would give full documentation for their loans and didn't even know they got a no-doc loan. And the lenders had rules do not include any of the documentation papers in the file because they also didn't want to show the mismatch. And then even at the regulator level, the, the reports in 2007, the regulators bragged that they had set a record for the lowest number of bank failures, the longest string of low bank failures because all this money was pouring in and the, you know, the losses hadn't hit, hit yet. But the extraordinary amounts of money, so the broker gets paid more, the lender gets paid more, the securitizer gets paid more, and the investor is getting a yield that is greater than what the credit rating that you know, says they should. Um, and, and they all wanted volume. They just wanted more and more and more of it. And, and so we had, I remember, the, the problem, this is where they did not have enough loans. There was so much demand. So big established firms, Bear Stearns came to us and talked to them. We told them, stay away from this. Well, they set up their own <laughs> subprime mortgage uh, company because that they needed the raw material were these loans. Even that wasn't enough, so they set up what we they set up what's the financial equivalent of fantasy football for subprime mortgages, where you could bet and buy securities, uh, synthetic securities, based on how these mortgages performed, even though they weren't directly tied to the mortgages, because there weren't enough mortgages to go around because everybody wanted in on this bonanza and feeding frenzy. And uh, on your, the other thing is every, when you talk to, when you talk to different institutions about it, when, when we confronted, you know, everybody pretended that they weren't responsible and they were just, they were just one part of a system that somebody else controlled. So the, you know, the lenders who were using uh, the Wall Street money would say, this is how the money comes to us. We have no choice. This is how we do it. And the, the Wall Street money would say, we're not making the loans. We hand tell them what to do. Which comes back to but there is some truth in that. I mean, so we were a mortgage lender, and we saw 80% of our volume go away because we were telling people, here is a good, fully documented, safe 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and the broker was saying, don't give me your documentation. I'm going to give you this teaser rate mortgage that doesn't escrow for your taxes, uh, et cetera. It looks cheaper. And if in the, it is very hard in the industry when there's a race to the bottom to say, no, nah, I'm just going to give up all that market share and stay with my standards. And so there has been some conversion within the industry that they recognize it's actually a better business model for them to have reasonable basic rules of the road. I do think there has been a change. And as I say, the big banks are not asking to roll back the credit card rules, the basics of the uh, mortgage origination and servicing rules. And on your, your more question, uh, it wasn't so much meant, I mean, you know, there, there was a, there were more rules yet to be written <laughs> at, the, at the Bureau, um, and a bunch of important stuff that didn't get gotten to, and there are a bunch of places where we thought rules should have been, you know, particular rules should have been stronger than they were. I, I was talking less about that, though, and more about sort of being ambitious about, uh, about the big picture, and I think of student lending, as Mike said, as one place where we are facing a, a huge crisis um, that's certainly not just about matters within the CFPB's jurisdiction, but is a huge crisis that needs to be treated as that. Or, you know, I think of like the credit reporting system, for example, where there's a set of problems that, um, that Peggy talked about and that's about accuracy and actually 
um, making sure that errors are corrected um, and that the information isn't and and then about you know being thoughtful about what additions or subtractions to what information is is used has what kind of impact on whom all of which are really important questions and affect lots of people but then I think also there's a set of questions about the, the way the credit report a deeper set of questions about the way the credit uh, scoring system functions like what are the problems with the system that even if the technical details are right, if you have less wealth, you're more likely to be late on your bills. And if you have less familial wealth, you have few other places to turn. And what are the consequences of kind of turning an existing difference of wealth into a system that keeps charging you more um, or keeps denying you access to better products? So that feels like the kind of next order question that we should be asking about. I just have uh, yeah, sorry. Oh. For the people that are watching on the oh, video sorry. stream, they've complained about um, all of us not speaking into the mic. <laughs> One thing that didn't get mentioned was subprime auto loans. And two, two really quick points. One is, after bankruptcy, the first thing that General Motors bought was a subprime blender. And the second thing is, if anybody heard what uh, Rashida had to say, at the uh, hearings on uh, subprime loans in her district. Uh, I was wondering if anybody has any comments. Absolutely, and, and one of the challenges with this is um, it's hard to, to get people to do apples to apples comparison of the default rates with cars and mortgages. People sort of use the mortgage default rate, well, that's a, a benchmark people know what that is autos they flip through you go from a late payment to losing your car in 60 days or less in most states and so they'll advertise oh we're only four percent delinquent at any point in time but you play it's sort of like the payday loans you play that out through six times through the year uh the, that's how many people will cycle through that for those default rates and the subprime auto is uh, is a disaster. And, I mean, Santander, a bunch of companies have had problems there. The CFPB that was going after a lot of them, um, as well as the other regulators. And that's one thing I do think is a point that the CFPB has changed the whole environment. And if you look at the other regulators, I think the other regulators are doing a better job. Uh, because of what the CFPB has done. You know, the, for, it, it, the Federal Reserve has gone after Wells pretty hard. I mean, an asset cap for a year and a half, all these other things. That, that was not how it was done pre-Dodd-Frank. Uh, so I do think it's changed the expectations for regulators. And maybe one, one specific point, tie, tying the auto and the expectations uh, for, for other regulators. You know, it, it, Auto, uh, the CFPB specifically did not get authority uh, to regulate auto dealers uh, in Dodd-Frank because the auto dealers fought so hard and got themselves exempted. But as the sort of consolation prize, uh, they, uh, the FTC has uh, regular, not it's, it's terrible, impossible process, but regular rulemaking authority in that area. They haven't done anything uh, with it. And uh, you know, the, the kind of like bonusy yield spread pre premium payments that were such a problem in the mortgage market still exist in the auto finance market and drive racial discrimination. Um, and, uh, you know, we should all be demanding uh, that the FTC act on its authority uh, to deal with uh, abusive auto loans. Thank you. Can we acknowledge our panel? Thank you.